Hello, my name is Christopher Stone. I come from the UK and I'm based in London. And I work at a research centre there called DECAL, Deafness, Cognition and Language Research Centre. We get our funding via the British government through an organisation that funds a variety of research projects. And so far we've been successful in having 10 years of funding. That body is called the Economic and Social Research Council. I've been fortunate enough to be invited to work this semester at Gallaudet and it's been a real honour to work here. Similarly, Mary Latfer asked me if I would do something for the GU RIEC programme, talking about interpreting and pragmatics. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And you'll see from the slides that I'm looking at insights from deaf interpreters' target language focus renderings. Specifically how the work that they do can help us to improve what we do. I'll explain the structure of my presentation and then we'll move forward. Firstly, I want to talk about deaf interpreters, DIs, and just draw attention to the fact that this is not a new phenomenon. I then want to think about what we mean when we're talking about interpreting. I will go on to explain the pragmatic theoretical framework that I use, which is called RT, or relevance theory. I will describe some of the pragmatic decisions that we see made by translators and interpreters. And then I'll give you some examples from my research data and my analysis. Some of the participants in my research were DIs and some hearing interpreters. So after I've explained some of the analyses, I then want to look at how the decisions are similar or different, and then I'll tell you my conclusions. Okay, so if we look at the next slide, it's not a new thing. We can see from some other research in this quote that many moons ago, before America was the United States, so I'm talking about 1640, which at that time would have meant it was still under British rule and was a British colony. You had yet to become an independent United States. And so that's almost 400 years ago. At that time, if you wanted to become a member of the Puritan Church, it would have meant needing to witness God in your life to do that visibly, and then to be questioned and examined by the elders of the church. And we can see from this quote a woman called Sarah who was born deaf, and her husband, Matthew, who was also deaf but became deaf at the age of 12, both of whom used sign language, and from the records it looks like Matthew had good possible speech reading, maybe some good spoken English, and was a good reader of English. During the examination by the Puritan church leaders, we saw that Sarah's sisters worked as what we would understand to be sign language interpreters, and his, her husband at that time also made a written transcript of what was said. So, assuming that Sarah, who was born in 1640, and was examined when she was aged between 35 or 40 years old, that means in around 1675 or 1680, somewhere around that time, we appear to have a deaf DI and hearing interpreter team working together. So it's clear that this isn't a new thing. DIs aren't new. They've been around for a long time. In the next slide we see also that the woman who wrote the previous article, Bruder Carty, has actually collaborated with me on some other research uh, with a colleague called Robert Adam. And we looked at 
deaf people who worked within the community or supported members of their community uh, and they undertook interviews with them. They were aged between 50 to 80 and we were interested in how they used their English skills to support members of their community or if indeed they did. And it seems that often within the deaf clubs somebody would be known to be very good at English and so if you had a letter you didn't understand, or a tax form you didn't understand, or you were going for a bank loan and you needed to fill in forms, or other events possibly, these people who were skilled at English would support other members of their community. So although this seems to be a hidden historical fact, it seems to be something that's been around for many years. And these weren't all the deaf people, but sign languages and deaf people. They may have had good speech reading skills, they clearly had good literacy in written English and being able to read English, and they would support their community with those English skills. And that seems to be part of the skills exchange that we know occurred historically within the deaf community. In the past it may have been that you gave your shoes to be mended to the deaf person who was trained as a cobbler, or perhaps you gave your trousers to somebody who was trained as a tailor or a seamstress. But it seems that since the time of Matthew, Sarah's husband, from that time onwards, deaf people who've had skills have supported each other, and that's included English skills. And DIs appear to be a public instantiation of that. Whenever we've gone to present our research in other countries, here in the United States, in England, and across the globe, people have always said that they recognise that story. And yet, this wasn't included in my interpreter training programme. It's definitely something that's part of the deaf community, and yet it's a hidden history that we're not aware of. So as I've said, it's not new, But it would appear that this role has continued. And my research within the tele interpreted television news, what we call in vision interpreting, appears to be a, a furtherance of this role. I'll explain that in greater depth later, but if we move on to the next slide, just to give you a, a context of the UK, similar to the US, we lobbied for captions for television. We know in the past deaf people often had to be very creative when they were watching television programmes because there was no captions. Now we have captions and some older members of the community might feel that their stories were more creative and more interesting, but those days are gone now, at least in the UK and the US. So we had a similar lobby in the UK and the people who led that lobby were sign languages and deaf people. And it was the hard of hearing community who joined in that campaign, but they didn't lead the campaign. We also saw that in the United Kingdom, the sign language using deaf community wanted to see their language on television. We have seven languages indigenous to the United Kingdom, so the British Isles, English of course, four Celtic languages, Welsh, Scots Gaelic, Irish Gaelic, and uh, Cornish, which is found in the southwest. And we also have two sign languages uh, within the United Kingdom, so British Sign Language, BSL, and then also in Northern Ireland we have a smaller community which uses ISL, Irish Sign Language. During the lobby for captioning we saw that the sign language and deaf people wanted to ensure that sign language was on television as well. They were very successful in getting 100% subtitles very early on. But then finally we saw in 1996 the Broadcasting Act which said that sign language was required to be on television. We then saw, in 2003, with the Communication Act, a very clear description of what was required. With this stated that at least 5% of broadcast television had to have sign language on it. So that means, for example, the BBC, which is a globally known brand, has to have 5% of its British broadcasts with sign language on it. Now obviously most mainstream broadcasters don't necessarily want to pay for deaf community programs, so the way the law was written meant that five, the 5% which had 
to have sign language could be presented in sign language or translated into sign language. And so most of the money goes towards the translation programs rather than the creation of deaf programs. Most of the time when people think about interpreted television, they often think of a small bubble or egg. So I'm going to give you the example of the Queen's Speech, which is broadcast every year. It was started by her father, and at that time it was broadcast on the radio. Of course now we use television. And the Queen is broadcast on BBC One, and on BBC Two we see the InVision translated version. So I'll give you a quick look at, at the video tip that I have of that. So you can see that the main picture is reduced and the deaf person appears. That woman is a deaf person from a deaf family who has deaf grandparents as well. Having chatted with her, she seems to have a similar role to the ghost writers, writers that we described earlier. Growing up in the deaf school, she had good English and she was able to support her friends. If they didn't understand the teacher, she supported their friends. And then also when deaf people came to watch the school theatre production, she was up in the gods doing some interpreting so that they knew what was going on. And it seems that that community experience has now become public in her role as an envision worker. And I was curious about that. There seems to be many deaf people now who are undertaking that role, but it seems that the role that occurred in the deaf club, people who were literate and able to support people in their writing, maybe they could read the newspaper and then disseminate that news within the deaf club, it seems that that hidden history of that private role has now become a public role within vision work. Many of the people also say that they feel like they are deaf news readers. They know that they're using translation as a skill, they need to read English and render that into British Sign Language, but they construct their role more as a news reader. We've had many deaf programs, one of which is still running, called See Here, and it's been going for over 30 years now. It's a very similar format to Deaf Mosaic all those years ago with Lou Fant and Gil Eastman. Although that doesn't appear as a format anymore in the US, we still have a program like that in the UK, and there have been many other programs that have come, come and gone over the years. But these seem to have formed, these deaf presenters seem to have formed that model of what sign language can look like on television. And also, the work that those presenters did from Teleprompter has informed the role of the deaf envision worker who works from that teleprompter, that auto cue, that scrolling English. And I was interested to see what deaf envision workers did compared with non-deaf envision workers. I have a fuller description of, of the, the work that I did in a study which is now published as a, my PhD which is now published as a book, but um, I was interested in these deaf interpreters or translators, what that meant and what they did and, and how they worked. So if we look at the next slide, when we're thinking about translation and interpreting, what do we think we're doing? And I like this quote that you can see on the slide from Stokes. There are two cultural systems that the translator is trying to connect within his mind, his or her mind. And by that we know that the translator is trying to ensure that the target audience has a similar understanding as the, the original audience. And that can happen because you have two different cultures and many different discourse fields that you're drawing from 
as a translator to try and create that connection. And I think that that typifies what my understanding of interpreting is. Although we need to be bilingual, being an interpreter is not about language, it's about people, it's about interaction, and it's about how we use language, but not about the language itself. So when we're thinking about interpreting, I like the next slide with good. Well, here we see a quote in French. And how would an interpreter or translator interpret that or render that into spoken English? Well, they could say this first quote, what is the proportion of indirect labour applied to the maintenance of the fixed capital? Well, for me, this seems to have parallels with sign language interpreting. Often people see an interpreter and they'll say, that's not British Sign Language, that's very English. But sometimes it's not that. It's not that somebody isn't using a language in a syntactically appropriate way. It's just that they're not using the language in a way that we use the language. So that English syntax is appropriate, the words are appropriate, and they're definitely English. But I don't understand what that sentence means. So were I to be within that meeting when that interpreter was required to render that sentence, I wouldn't have understood that interpretation. I would rather have an interpreter who says, this second example, how many people do you employ to keep the pl place clean and maintain the equipment? I understand that. I understand what that means. It's a very clear use of English for me. Often when we're talking about processing meaning, we don't describe what we mean by that. My understanding is that what we want is for the audience to understand that their cognitive effort is reduced. So, as an interpreter, I undertake as much effort as possible so that I can meet the needs of the audience and it's clear for them and they have a reduced cognitive load. So I was interested that if we have DIs who've grown up in the deaf community and have experience of the diversity of the deaf community, how do they connect with their audience? And one of the theories that I found appealing was RT, or relevance theory. This was authored by Dan Sperber and Deirdre Wilson back in 1986. And this explores how we make something optimally relevant to our addressee. Many of you may be familiar with Grice and his maxims of communication. This could be considered a post gricean theory. We're human beings. We have a human cognitive system. We come from a language group. That language community has its own associated culture. And we understand how we use language within a situation, how we use those contextual assumptions to understand things. If people say too much, we, don't want them, we want them to stop. If they don't say enough, we don't understand what they mean. It's only by understanding that, that all of those cultural assumptions, including cultural knowledge, that we're able to communicate efficiently and effectively. So we filter our intentions through language, our culture, our situation, to meet the needs of our addressee. So as an example, I'm not an American, I'm signing ASL, but it's not necessarily how an American would sign ASL. It's ASL gym, but not as we know it. That doesn't mean that I'm not saying ASL, but it may be that I'm not using ASL in the way that Americans use ASL. And just to take another example, I went to buy a, what I would call, mobile phone, as opposed to a cell phone here in the US. I went to the store, and I asked several questions, and in that discussion it became clear to me that how you discuss mobile phones, cell phones, and how we discuss mobile phones is very different. I wanted a SIM-only contract that means something quite different in the UK, clearly, 
And I realized that I needed to stop that interaction, talk to an American person, and then find out how I could use the language appropriately to talk about that subject. It wasn't that I wasn't using the language, it's that I wasn't using it the way people use it. And that's the same when we interpret. Sometimes we're speaking English, or we're signing the sign language that we're using, but we're not using it in the same way. And I was interested to know that if DIs have grown up within the deaf community, how do they use their language? At that time, many deaf people were pleased to see DIs on television. I was curious to see whether it was just an identity thing, or whether it was actually to do with language usage. So RT, Relevance Theory, addresses how the audience recovers an intended meaning instantly. But it specifically is interested in how that happens. How is it that somebody automatically recovers meaning? How do we ensure that we encode enough information, that we're not too vague, that we're not incomplete, so that we can be adequately relevant for interpretation. We know that language is used within a situation, within that context, and we also bring our culture and our community values to bear on that. And so what relevance theory proposes is that within that context, we use all of those things to enrich information. So I have an example to explain more clearly what I mean by our understanding of contextual assumptions. And it's from the phrase, it's raining. Now you know I'm British and so of course we're obsessed with rain in the weather. But if we take the phrase, it's raining, similar to the sign, it's raining, what do we understand that to mean? What does that mean within a shared cognitive environment? What contextual assumptions do we make? If I'm standing outside here in DC and I say it's raining, what does that mean? Well, it means it's raining. But it also means it's raining here in DC. And it also means at this present moment. So even though I've just said the phrase, it's raining, and you can see on this slide now that there are parentheses saying in DC at the present moment, what I'm saying is that relevance theory would say that this is the semantic representation of what that phrase means. Now this is an automatic thing, this is about human cognition and it's about how our brain works. Often it's not even something we're conscious of. We automatically enrich what people say to understand what it means. Now, when we look at translations, that can actually help us to understand that enrichment process. We can understand that when we move from one language to another, the translator has understood the semantic representation represented by those words and then enriched it into the other language if that's required and that tells us something about human cognition and it tells us something about how we process meaning. So, the phrase it's raining means it's raining in DC at the present moment. That doesn't mean we need to say it's raining now, but you're now watching this on a computer and you're not here with me. So I'm just looking out of the window, I can see it's spitting a little bit in DC. No, I can say DC because you're not here present now. So, but if you were standing with me, I wouldn't need to say that. That wouldn't be something that I would need to add. So these are the types of enrichments that we see described within a relevance theory framework. And it looks like, with that specific phrase, it's raining, that works equally well in English, in ASL, in BSL. So sometimes the surface form of languages functions to achieve the same semantic representation. But sometimes the 
semantic representation by a very small field is not represented in the same form in another language. And so we need to perform these enrichments. We need to add more information to include information which is implicit in the other phrase. So I'll now move on to give you some examples of my data, so hopefully this will become more clear. Firstly, I want to make it clear that I was interested in the broadcast news. In the UK, we have regional news, which is interpreted by our in-vision workers, both uh, deaf and both DIs and hearing people. And at the time of undertaking my PhD, I recorded them by a videotape, which of course we still had at that time. Some of those formats are headlines, some of them are weekly news review programmes, and then the final data I collected was in, by inviting some people into a simulated studio within the land to actually observe their process. One of the reasons I chose the news is because it's just about information. It doesn't have strong prosodic information, and the aim is to inform people. Secondly, the workers have to stand in front of a camera and they have to imagine who their audience might be. So imagine who the deaf audience is and then trying to... So by looking at this, I was able to try and understand their process, who they thought they were, they were reaching. One of the things I also looked at was the process and it's clear that the and I'm not describing that here, but the deaf interpreters seemed to follow a different process, and I've explained it more within the book, so please feel free to read that if you want to. But the deaf DIs appear to follow a translation process more, and the hearing interpreters seem to follow an interpretation process more. Here, whilst the hearing interpreters could have read the script, performed the script, practiced it, rehearsed it, watched the videotape, adjusted their rendering accordingly, they chose not to do that. They would often speak out loud about what their thought processes were, but they didn't ever say it. Whereas, until the final rendering, whereas the deaf DIs did. They went through a process of uh, editing, one could call it, and re-editing, rehearsing, so that the final product was a rehearsed product. And that may explain why we see some of the differences. And that's also what I call a deaf translation mean. But we can talk about that later. So I had a variety of different kinds of data, and we saw a variety of different kinds of pragmatic decisions. One author, Sequeiros, has actually looked at Spanish-English translations and identified some pragmatic decisions, categories of these decisions, applying the relevance theory to, this, to his data. Some of my data also appeared to have things which looked like the categories he'd found, and some of them appeared to be new whether they're specific to British Sign Language, whether they're more generally applicable to Sign Language, whether they're applicable to ASL, would be interesting. But I'll give you some examples. So firstly, we'll look at translations that undergo enrichment. Within the script, we saw that the English script said this afternoon, and the BSL said afternoon at the moment. So if we think about this specifically, this means that the time frame is much more specific in BSL compared to the English script. We would call that an enrichment. It's possible that you can have something which goes the other way as well, which is called an impoverishment by Sikeros. And that can be conceptualised presumably in a number of ways in sign language. Here, in the English script, it said this morning, which is a broad morning time, whereas the BSL said today, 
And so that's a less specific information. We're less likely to know when. And so those types of decisions which are linked with time are called temporal pragmatic decisions. We saw some other types of enrichments too. One of the things which I found which appears to be related to sign language was a locational enrichment. Here we see the English script say, on the Clyde. The Clyde is a river, just to let you know. And there are a number of different Clydes within the UK. All of the people who came into sign that, finger spelled Clyde, and then added Scotland. We have a different sign for that in the UK. I think it's important to, to point out at the moment, I asked a colleague of mine if they could record some Scottish news, and the people who came into the lab were not from Scotland, and were told that the audience was a general UK audience. None of them had any experience of working on Scottish television, and so it may have been that they were thinking that because it was generally across the UK, they added the location of information in Scotland. And this is similar to the temporal enrichment, where we have more specific information. It gives us more information. Had they had more experience working in Scotland or been told that it was a Scottish audience, it may have been that they didn't mention Scotland. They knew that the audience would automatically know that the Clyde was a specific river in Scotland, and so they may not have included that. And again, that would have meant that they would have been working with contextual assumptions to do with that community, that culture, that audience. And so again, this is the type of decision they made according to the contextual assumptions they were, they were given. What's interesting is that Sikeros sees that some of these things happen because the, they're grammatically required by the language. You have to render one language in a very specific way in the other language because linguistically it's required. Others of these decisions happen because the translator makes a decision to enrich or impoverish the target language. And I was interested in why people did that, and I interviewed the people who came in. And so part of the process enabled me to understand why they thought they were doing these things. And it looks like the main driver for these things was for clarity, to reduce the cognitive effort of the audience. I have some examples which I'll give you, and some of them seem to be more clearly translated decisions, others linguistic decisions, some are less clear, it could be one or the other. So the thematic agent enrichment. If we look at one example from the script, in English they talked about three protesters, and in BSL you see the example three, and then a person classifier, and then the verb protest and the verb object. So from three protesters, we see quite a lot more context being given in that enrichment. One of the Envision people decided not to add the three-person classifier. And I asked a native signer who was deaf if they could say whether they were both grammatically accurate or not. They had had training in linguistics, so I could ask that specific question. Are they grammatically correct? And then the deaf person felt that they were, the informant felt that they were, and so it looked like these decision, the decision was really on the part of the translator to be more clear, to enrich, to reduce the effort of the audience who were watching that from the television. So three specifically people, and this perhaps was also related to the video footage that was happening, uh, but it seems that this was definitely a translated decision rather than something that was required by the language. Moving on to the next example, and this is a specific category I found within my PhD, <clears throat> and this is goal enrichment. 
Here, the English script said a vote of no confidence, and this was a news um, article to do with government. And the BSL said vote nothing, confidence index person classifier. The locus that was set up in space and we referred to had already been established to be a specific person within the news story. And then there was the addition of the classifier, and we know that English doesn't have classifiers, but it looks like, if we think about the semantic representation, that this is saying a vote of no confidence in the previous referent, that person. And I was very interested to see that. It wasn't clear to me whether this was linguistically required or whether it was a decision by the translator. And again, here it looks like it's the translator's decisions to add those enrichments. They're not required, but they do reduce the effort of comprehension for the audience. So it seems that the translator is aiming for it to be easier for the audience to watch and understand, to really connect with the other culture. In the next slide, this is source enrichment, as opposed to goal enrichment, and again this was something which I found within my PhD. This part of the text was specifically talking about a story about seaweed. In uh, English it says this stuff is native in Japan, but it's gradually spreading around the world. And in BSO we seem to see, have something very different. If you look at the PowerPoint slides, you'll see that I've highlighted some things in orange text, and they show the enrichment. So the verb spreading could actually be represented in a number of different ways in British Sign Language, and I suspect it's the same for ASL. It could be spread around the world, as a specific inflection of the verb, or it could be spread without any, in a very neutral fashion, and yet all of the translators appeared, once they'd set up the locus for Japan, they initiated the verb from that specific place. Even though that doesn't appear to be required, it looked like that they specifically wanted to ensure that the audience knew that they were reinforcing with this source enrichment that the spreading had started in Japan. So again, we can ask the question, is that a linguistic decision or a translated decision? And it looks like it's a translated decision. And now, I, I want to say at this point, we're not shocked that translators or interpreters make decisions. That's what we're paid to do. So it's nice to see that we can recognise the types of decisions that we and our colleagues make, the types of enrichments and impoverishments. And again, this next category and the next slide, visual incorporation, was something I identified in my PhD. And this appears to be the visual information for the video footage which co-occurs with the reading of the text. I think this is interesting for us as interpreters, because often when we're interpreting, we're interpreting into spoken language or into sign language within a context, within a situation. And so our translation needs to really be rooted into that context. We need to make sure that we're aware of what's going on. If somebody says this, it may be that they're pointing at a specific point on their PowerPoint, and we need to know what that is and potentially incorporate that into our translation. So I was fascinated to see how deaf people ensured that their translation fitted well within this multimedia context. We saw that the DIs would start to render when they read the script and then they would re-render and edit their translation, how they would sign this, when they saw the videotape. And this happened with when they saw the seaweed. And again, we see on the PowerPoint things highlighted in orange. So we see this stuff. And because of the videotape, we know that this refers to the seaweed. And the handshake that's chosen specifically encodes the visual form of the seaweed that we see on the videotape. We then see going to be 
some future construction. And this is encoded by the moving apart. And we know that this is some kind of progressive growing. And then at the end of that BSL rendering, we see longer in length circumference expand. That also fascinated me. When I asked the translators why they decided to do that, all of them said, well, we didn't know how the seaweed grew. If we'd had the time, we would have gone to the internet and we would have looked up how that kind of seaweed grew, checked on the name, seen whether it I observed whether it grew from the surface of the sea down, from the seabed up, or just across the surface of the sea. And the reason that they included a number of options was because it was vague enough to satisfy the audience's cognitive load. It was more clear, but at the same time, it wasn't specific to say exactly how the seaweed itself grew. So also, that was very interesting for me, even though it was visual incorporation to reduce the cognitive effort of the audience, it still looks like it was a good strategy to maintain some level of vaguity, or vagueness. And it may be that that kind of visual incorporation happens in other sign languages and could happen in other spoken, spoken languages as well. But it could be that the translator decided not to include this information, so I would say that this decision appears to be a translator decision rather than specifically linguistic. Just with a couple of final examples, I was interested in how the information was related to each other. Uh, in the complete study, which is described more in the book, I also looked at prosody, body movement, torso, head movement, to see how information was interrelated and we often saw that smaller pieces of information were nested within large episodic structures. So we saw complex ways of information being related together via prosody and that just could be something that native, native language users are able to do really with that level of proficiency and that non-natives aren't. I mean, in the same way as a native English speaker, I know that it's rare that I meet somebody who has the same level of expertise in English as I do. That doesn't mean that we're lousy, it just means that that's a fact. But one of the other ways that they, we saw the translators relate information was via explicature and implicature. So here in these enrichments, we see the role of the person made explicit with an explicature. In the English script, we have here's Willie Johnson. Of course, Willie is an unfortunate name in British English, but putting that to one side, we knew that he was a reporter because that's the structure of the news. But in the BSL, we see that this that explicatory is added. We have a reporter, and I can see that highlighted in orange. And then we also see an implicature that's enriched as well. We know that if we arrive at a reporter who's on an ad side broadcast, that they will discuss a certain topic more. So in the English it just states, here's Willie Johnson. Whereas in the BSL we saw, talk more. So we saw this relating of information so that it was clearer to the audience. This addition in BSL or enrichment made it clearer for the audience to know what was happening next. And this would appear to be a translated decision, thinking about how information that could be related in a seamless way from one idea to the other. I have one final example of uh, an implicature, or an impoverishment of an explicature to an implicature. In the English script, it said quite specifically, being given vaccines. So you could construct that as an injection to protect you from illness. But in the BSL, we saw just being inject arm. 
But I asked people why they'd made that decision, and the DI said, well, the aim of the story wasn't to talk specifically about the vaccines, it was just to mention them in passing. And we know that that sign means vaccine. If we added more information, then it would change the focus of the story. And it was okay to do that in a very impoverished way. Just the injection was fine. I mean, it could have been an injection technically for anything, but within that pragmatic context, it was understood to mean specifically vaccine. So even though it looks like in that context that that was a specifically a language or linguistic decision rather than a translator decision. And that makes me wonder how much we as L2 users of sign language, including myself, how much we are able to understand those pragmatic decisions linked with sign language. We're often very keen to make additions or enrich, but it's not necessarily often for us to feel comfortable reducing the information. So when are we aware of when the language should be forcing us to make a different decision so that it's pragmatically understood clearly? And it may be that deaf people who grow up in the community are more able to make those decisions because of their experience of the diversity of the deaf community as opposed to L2 users. So I've given you some examples of my data of the different types of enrichments and impoverishments. Now I want to give you some numbers, as it were, or just look at whether deaf and hearing people made similar or different decisions and, and what that looked like. So if we move on to the next slide. Within the simulated data of the lab, it was nice because all of the people were using the same script, but of course it's not a real situation. When I counted up the numbers of enrichments and the numbers of impoverishments, it looks like within the lab, the DIs and the hearing interpreters performed the same number of enrichments. They weren't necessarily the same types of enrichments, but they were the same number of enrichments. But the hearing interpreters performed double the number of impoverishments. Now initially I was a little bit shocked and it looked like it looks like within the lab that pressure in the artificial environment meant that their process wasn't real. And so it seems that they wanted to produce more impoverishments. I didn't do any cognition, cognit um, comprehension tests, so I'm not sure how that would have affected the audience's comprehension, but for me it looked like the artificial situation changed the, their approach. So putting that data to one side, if you look at the real data, the data of the broadcast television, it looks like the, both the DIs and the hearing interpreters performed more enrich enrichments than impoverishments. It looks like the DIs performed less enrichments than the hearing interpreters, and that the DIs performed more impoverishments than the hearing interpreters. I think that's fascinating. So I've described the context of television, I've described the context of DIs who perhaps have grown up in the community and had those experiences. And so we've now seen that there are differences in the numbers of types of decisions people make. And it could be because it's L1 and L2 issue, but I'll, I'll come to my conclusions now. So looking, on, looking to the conclusion slides, it seems that generally those working in vision are trying to decrease the cognitive effort of the audience. They're trying to ensure that the audience understands more clearly. It looks like that the translators are trying to produce a clear target language. From the interviews that I had with the deaf interpreters, one gave a, gave a very nice quote, and they said, for them it was like watching a jigsaw puzzle 
when they watch the deaf people working, they've got the centre of the puzzle and the picture unfolded clearly. Whereas with the hearing interpreters, you got the outside framework and it came out and it wasn't clear, you didn't see the picture. So it seems that even though the aim was to reduce the cognitive effort, there was still that fluency for L1 native users which wasn't quite, which L2 users weren't quite able to ensure they achieved. Within the translations, both enrichments and impoverishments occurred, and that's not a shock, we are interpreters and translators and we paid to make decisions. But the decisions that the two groups made weren't the same. It looks like the deaf interpreters, the DIs, didn't feel the need to over-enrich. They'd grown up going to the deaf club, went to deaf schools, saw the diversity of their community, and were able to deliver that language in a way which was adequate for their community knowing what the community knew. And also that was appropriate for the multimedia context that they were interpreting within. It also looks like that the DIs were confident in their cultural knowledge. They knew that they could make some impoverishments and they used that strategy to maximum effect. I was also curious, why do we remember, are there any other reasons as to why this may have occurred? Now it may be because the process is different. I said previously in this presentation that the DIs read the script, they kept performing the script, they watched the videotape, they kept performing the script, they rehearsed and changed, they polished the product they were going to produce, and then they finally produced that product. Whereas the hearing interpreters, although they read the script and they thought about it, and they watched the videotape and they thought about it, they didn't manually practice, but uh, didn't manually articulate the target language. And so they didn't have something physically rooted in their production. But it could also be because the, there's a community norm, a deaf translation norm. Growing up in the community, if you're a fluent, competent English user, you have multiple experiences of explaining to other members of your community what things mean. And you're able to draw upon that experience. And that's really what my book called Towards a Deaf Translation Norm tries to describe and see. This is something which has happened historically. It's something that still happens now. Fluent bilinguals support other members of their community. I think it needs more analysis, and I think we also need to understand it better to be able to include it in training, so that we all become more aware of what deaf bilinguals do, and what expectation that may create within the community. I found that it was useful to look at relevance theory and pragmatics to think of language usage, so rather than thinking about performing the language itself, actually using the language in a way which the community uses the language. So thank you very much for your attention. I have a couple more slides. The next one is references, so you, so you can read more. Uh, about some of the things I've talked about. And then finally, thank you very much for your attention. You see my emails here. If you're interested in, uh, if you have some questions, please feel free to email me. But we will also be having a discussion group after, this, after you've watched this. So please, if you're interested, Join in the discussion group so we can have some more in-depth discussions. Thank you very much. Okay. The end. Is it working? Oh.